as you can see. Oh, it's, it's the term, it's the word, it's the thing that you've all been waiting for, the neural network. The thing that is running our lives, taking control over everything. And in fact, this is, you know, the thing that everyone's begging to get into AI to learn, right? But what that kind of means is, again, what we're trying to look at here is remember the end game. You know, it, it, when we think about this idea of machine learning and artificial intelligence, again, what we're trying to do is model how we think. How do we make decisions? How do ants make decisions? How does anything make decisions? And if you remember, again, why I said ants and sort of the kind of getting back into that world, we referred to it as biologically inspired algorithms, right? We observed something in nature that essentially, right, that's making the decision. It's our thing that's like, oh, well, you know, here's a thing that through just the chaos of the universe, here's how this thing has made sort of its design. Why that kind of works or why that kind of matters is because when we think about neural networks, that same process is going on, right? The entire idea is, again, you have one of these. It's a brain, right? The entire idea is that it has electronic signals going on at all times. Right now, it is firing. I hope it's firing. Please tell me it's firing. Is it firing? Good, thank you, right? But what does it mean by firing? What is that? What are all those electronical signals going on? Well, again, your brain is just a combination of neurons. Now, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a brain surgeon at all. So it's a whole lot of, you know, me trying to understand that. I know math. I don't, right? But the entire idea is, right, when we think about the neuron, the entire concept behind it is what inspired the neural network, or what we'll talk about in a second, the perceptron, right? We have, again, this idea of dendrites in our own brains, right? Or, you know, just raw one of these, right? We, right, just put you away. We have some form of a, you know, nucleus going on here. But the idea is, when you think about, like, the idea of neurons... They're interconnected to some other neuron in some way. But it's not like this. It's not, you know, just like, a, it's not circles connected to lines, right? It's some biological process. And so what we've got is, in essence, what we call dendrites. Right? They are connected to us. That's where the electrical signals from the nucleus are shooting outward. But specifically, those are receptors, right? This is where... Who here has ever, like, watched a little bit of, like, how your brain operates on drugs? Anyone? Anyone? Thank you. Thank you. Right? How your brain works on drugs when it is talking about a dendrite, right, is this is actually how it looks at the end of the day, right? Or this is the representation that we make. Because, again, it's chemical signals. When you, just because I see some caffeine in the class, right, when you're drinking your caffeine, what is happening, right? That is, it's not even caffeine. What's the, uh, andosol? Andosol is, I think, the uh, chemical compound that's basically being shot out from one thing into the next. And what happens is you've got these tiny little binders going on. That are connect. Well, let me change colors there. Mm -hmm. You got little binders that are making little connections with those chemicals. That's where your serotonins. That's where your dopamines. That's where your um, what's the other ones? Serotonin, dopamine. What is it? Sorry, I heard Bram. What are the other chemicals going on? The serotonin, dopamine. What? Sure. Right. Norepinephrine. Yep. Drugs. 
my point being is this is where this effect is coming in. So why I'm using the analogy of caffeine is, right, what happens is it is blocking a lot of that andosol from hitting your receptors. And why that matters is andosol makes you feel tired. If your brain cannot get the andosol that it is accepting, again, I'm really blowing that word up uh, uh, incorrectly, but right, the thing that caffeine is blocking, right, what happens is your brain isn't getting. It, those chemicals are just sitting in your brain, and your brain doesn't see them right, from these receptors. My point being, getting back to sort of this approach, is when we're collecting our neuron, right, these are sort of the connections. They are receiving inputs from other neurons. But then there's the output, right? Again, there is some thing now known as the axon. And you may remember, right, this is just through that connection because we talked about it, uh, you know, in natural language processing, DAI, diffuse axonal injury, that's what that injury is, is this thing broke. This thing has been damaged. But the entire idea, right, is all of those inputs that the dendrites are receiving, they're going into the nucleus, right? It's an electrical signal that's happening in your brain. And so what will happen, right, is you can imagine that it's almost like a capacitor, right? Hey, electrical signals coming in from each one of these dendrites. And at some point, a charge is built, and beep, it gets shot out. So that's where we start to kind of look at this idea, right, of the neural network. Hey, I can receive inputs, and I can receive or I can make an output in some way. But just to continue using my analogy of drugs, what happens when you use too much of a drug? You build up a tolerance, right? Why I mention that is specifically, again, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, what, it, what would that mean on a physical level, right? Again, we're trying to model the world. So maybe I have dendrites that need much, much more. They need a, more receptors. They need more blockers. They need these types of things to make that signal actually happen. And so, again, that actually starts to form what we start to look at from the computer science perspective, right? So this is what we start to call the perceptron. Right? Rather than, you know, oh, because that doesn't make any, how are you going to model that, right? All of that stuff, oh, it's too biological. Let's treat it just like a math equation for a second, right? I have suddenly inputs, right? Inputs, no different than when I was thinking about them from chemical deposits and blocks, right? Well, now those are going into some nucleus, but why I talked about the idea of tolerance, right? It's not just one, not just the other, but it's all of them. Some sort of weight is being applied to every single one of those inputs because maybe, right, if, it, if my input came in, right, let's imagine it's this one, right, maybe that needs a lot more of the input to really kind of matter. So suddenly, what I've noticed is I have some weights. I have a variable that I can apply to those inputs, right? Same kind of concepts that are going on here. So now what? Now what happens? Well, remember, we're building up a charge. We're trying to feed in electrical signals to that neuron, or in our equivalent, a big old orange circle, right? So the idea becomes, well, when do I fire the signal? Remember, everything that we're doing, we're essentially just trying to model this behavior of when do I send the electrical signal from the brain, from the neuron? And so what we start to get at is something that we call the activation function. When do I send a signal? Or what type of signal do I send when I get some kind of input? 
this is where we can get into a little, we'll talk about it, but it depends on the activation signal that you choose. And which one is the best one? Yes, right? However, what I will go ahead and do is I will say, let's start simple. Let's start with a very basic one just to kind of really convey what we're seeing here, right? This idea that, hey, whatever that input, you know, is, whatever these things are, right, whatever the magic is that we're about to show and talk about, if it is greater than zero, one, right, because we're a number or we're, we're a program rather than biological where, I don't, you know, one. If it is not greater than zero, negative one. Good? Everyone okay with my zeros and negative ones or my one and negative one? Good, good, good. Okay. Right? So again, what we're kind of getting at is this idea that we're letting the signal say something, right? We're not we're we're not doing that whole build up a capacitor until the charge occurs. But rather, as soon as our inputs are coming in, we are making some form of send off. We are making some kind of output as a result. Again, very similar to what we see with just methods in programming, right? But why do we get that? Because again, that little green bar that I got going on there, that is in fact that signal. That's the Axon, right? It's me taking in all the inputs. It's me doing my activation calculation. And it is me spitting out the result afterwards. It's, again, like I said, it's a method. It's black box methods from 116 land in a nutshell. But you can start to see we can go into a little bit more finesse with this, right? So do I send out one thing? Or could I potentially send out multiple things, right? Well, again, it's what's the activation function? What are you choosing to do with it, right? Maybe you make the axon, you know, you draw three more, you know, two more axons on this thing, right? That, that is where the design comes into play. And we'll see when we get into uh, generative AI on Wednesday, specifically, like, what do you do in that situation, right? That's a little bit more complicated with math. We'll get there. We got more, we got math to deal with. Let's limit our math today. So what do we do? Well, again, if you think about it, I have some input, right? I've got some x1, maybe some x2, some x3, x4, x5, x6. Six. I have all these inputs. Now, what my job is, is again, each one of those is taking some form of weight as well. Now, what that means in our sense is we are going to do a simple multiplication. Take my input, boom. Take the weight for that input, boom. Then what? Add them together. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. You're just running through this sum product uh, approach. And then, as you can see, based on our simple, our simple little activation function here, hey, take all those numbers, multiply them together, add it up. And if it's greater than zero, give me a one. So again, right? So now my output is just going to be whatever, uh, either one or negative one, based on, hey, is this above some threshold. Good so far? Yeah, good. Okay, fine, fine. So again, as we start to build up this calculation, let's go ahead and work off of a very, very simple example. There are numbers out there in the world. You may not believe it, but there are numbers out there in the world. Some of them are even, but some of them are odd. I know, gasp. And it is our job to determine which one is even and which one is odd. Now, why I kind of present that is, oh, hey, you know, numbers, right? Oh, numbers. Specifically, though, I want to think about this from an input standpoint, right? Why I'm presenting these numbers is if you think about a number, specifically I'm going to work with just uh, eight bits, 
right? A number can be referred to as a binary string, right? I have sort of this combination of ones and zeros, and that would represent 48, right? Just because I don't trust any of y'all, right? Right? This is signals going on here. So this is, uh, what is that? That's 2 to the 0th power, 2 to the 1 power, 2 to the 2 power, 2 to the 3, 2 to the 4, 2 to the 5, 2 to the 6, 2 to the 7th, right? 2 to the 5th power is 32 plus 32 plus 16, 48. Ta-da! Why I present that is, though, again, think about what I'm looking at with all those inputs. Each one of these zeros or ones can serve as its own input that has its own weights attached to it. Now, yes, you all learned that it's going to be this, right? This is the, the indicator. That's the point, is I'm going to show and prove that we can teach a computer that. I know, right? So again, as we start to build that up, right, each one of those bits is now serving as an input. They are my X to this neural network. And so again, what we're going to try and do is we're going to see if we can teach this neural network even or odd. Specifically, right, if you're thinking about it, I have labels. My activation function is going to be telling me a positive one or a negative one. Oh, well, since I have a binary classifier or a binary output, there's my labels. There's my kind of categorization going on there. Now, specifically as we start to think about that, right, again, I have all my inputs. I'm sort of presenting them in this way, you know, graphically just to kind of have them available. But now we got to deal with the weights, the weights. What do I give my weights, right? Those are numbers. I have my inputs, but what do I do here? What are, for this thing, right? How, like how much, how about, do I just give it a random number, right? As you can see, that, that is open research. That's an open question. What do I do? What do I put there? Do I do just random numbers? Do I just instantiate everything as a one. Uh, for my sake, I'm going to just e you know, evenly distribute one eighth. Why one eighth? Because I have eight inputs, so each one has its own equal weight to it. Good so far? Good, good. No brains, no brains. Motion, right? We need them connecting, right? So again, all right, well, again, what did I say we have to do? We take our inputs, we multiply it by its weight, and we add all of that up together, and we get some number. So in my case, I'm getting a 0 0.25. Now, remember, what was my activation function? If uh, i of my inputs is greater than or equal to 0, positive 1, else negative 1. And so, that calculation, is it above or below zero? It's above zero. And so, I return a positive one. And what did I say the positive one was? It's even. Ta-da. I'm done, right? Why, why is no one impressed? Well, let's find out why you're not impressed. So there's a cack in there. Okay, it's not enough. We get that. Why? Why? Well, what happens if I just plugged in another number? Right? Oh, okay. You, you know, your example was 48. So you very clearly chose an even number that would work, and you are correct. But what happens if I did make the 49, right? Oh, well, suddenly something that we as humans know should be odd, right? Well, that's not working, right? Because 
the same calculations. We do the same results, and I'm getting 0.375, and based on my rules, right, I just labeled it a plus one. I returned a plus one. I just said it was even. Hmm? That doesn't seem right. Right? Right. Thank you, thank you. You're the only one responding. The other one's... Right. Oh, okay, so now what we're essentially kind of presenting is I have a calculation. I have a way to make a decision, but what happens when the decision was wrong? That's what we're getting at now is this idea, hey, you messed up. You done messed up. You need to learn. You need to have this negative reinforcement uh, going on here. And so how do we go about doing that? So this is where we start to present the learning from experience, right? When you do a good job, cool, continue doing a good job. We're not going to do anything bad to you. But what happens when you don't do a good job? What happens when you're bad? Sorry, I've been thinking about like bad dog as a like joke and I couldn't, right? Bad dog, bad neural network, bad, bad. My point being, now what? Well, what's happening in the brain? What happens in the neurons? Well, negative reinforcement's kicking in. Oh, no, I don't want to be bad anymore. I don't want to have this be a mistake anymore. I need to correct myself. And so that is where we start to get into this idea right, of backpropagation. Now, we will only do a very simple version of backpropagation. This is mostly in the sense, uh, you know, I don't want to throw too much calculus in you because it starts doing derivatives everywhere. Uh, but my entire point is I need to take the fact that I was wrong with 49 and I need to correct. Oh, hey, you know, maybe that shouldn't be as much as we said it was. Oh, hey, maybe you need to be a little bit more. I know that, you know, again, for neural network, it would be our last one. Maybe you need to be much, much more uh, heavily weighted. Maybe you need just, like, that's a whole big old charge going on there, right? All those things need to happen. Now, how do I make it happen? So with my analogy or, you know, how I like to think about it, I got it wrong or my neural network got it wrong. I'm going to use the analogy of a car for a second, right? Okay, you see, it's a car, right? Now, I have a target. I have the correct designation. I have the correct spot I need to be as a car driving towards or guessing, right? I have my what I need to guess correctly. But as you notice, like in my case, the car is driving that way. It's not connecting the dots, right? It is not going to reach the target. It's going in the wrong direction. So now if we're thinking about that, right, you're driving the car, what do I have to do? Yes, yeah, okay, you can pantomime. Now tell me. Thank you. I got to turn, right? I got to make the shift. And so what we're seeing when I make that shift is I'm changing my velocity. I'm changing my trajectory of my model, right? And so what you can start to see is going on is I'm making some small correction, right? Because again, I, here's what I'm currently doing. Here's what the correct result is, where I should be going. Well, how much of a difference is that? What is the correction that I need to be making? And so what we start to see is, again, this idea of that steer, right? Again, what's that correction turning into? So I have my desired velocity. I have my current velocity. I need to correct based on that steering, right? I'm on the wrong track. How do I fix myself and by how much, right? So how we start to take this is that steer is essentially now my target minus my guess. This is one of the reasons we were using negative one and not zero here, is we really wanted to uh, separate these two values from each other. 
So again, if you notice, right, we're dealing with 49, right? We were dealing with 49. I'll come over here. I'll keep that, right? So I've got 49. I have... It's target. 49 is a negative, or sorry, it's not a negative number. It is an odd number, right? But what did I guess? Well, I guessed, or my neural network guessed, a positive one. So suddenly, right, as you can start to see this, it's a calculation, right? Now I'm starting to deal with my steer. I have a negative one, again, my target, minus my guess. So negative one minus positive one. I produced a number. Good so far? That number hasn't blown your minds? No mush? Still electrical signals fire? Good, good. So again, I now have this calculation. And so what I need to do is I need to train the model. I need to fix the model on, hey, this is how wrong you were, right? Again, think about it like it's the car. That correction, right, the steer, is how off you were from the correct target. And here's how much you would need to correct for it. So again, I have that calculation. I build out that negative two, right? And so now what do I do? I need to correct. I need to make that correction. The same thing I did with the steer of turning, what I need to end up doing is, hey, my weights, I need to update the weight formula. It's still going to be like the one eighth, right? That's one of the reasons why we have to have initial values for there. But then you notice I'm going to take, hey, let me add whatever that error was times whatever my actual input was. Because this is important, right? Again, this is what's dictating the actual decision making. This is just how important that weight was. But this is sort of the magnitude of that weight. Or that, this is the magnitude of this signal going on there, right? A scalar to that signal. So in that situation, OK, we take that negative 2, right? That's going to be you know, negative two times where we see the zeros, right? Those don't do anything, and where we see the ones, right? Ta-da! We're done. Now, what did I do? I won't say wrong, but how do I frame it? When I made my drive and I made my correction, right, what happens if I make, okay, I'm driving along, I'm driving along, and I saw the mistake, right? You all said turn, right? And we all agreed, turn. My question is, do I turn like that or do I turn like that? Right? Think about as you're driving. Hopefully you are not violently Grand Theft Autoing, you know, trying to turn immediately at a 90 degree angle. I've seen some of you drive around campus. Please stop. My point being is, no, you don't want to make this super harsh, like very firm turn. Again, you may be over correcting, right? Or you may be correcting too harshly at the beginning, right? That may be too much of a correction is what I'm trying to get at, because you were wrong. But does that mean I need to immediately snap directly to what the target was? Because that, again, may be too much of a shock to the system, right? Again, what may end up happening is you actually overcorrect, right? Uh, and overcorrecting could actually turn into you miss the target, even though you did correct for it, right? Because again, now that you've done this, right, you may get this wrong the next time around or something like that. Or again, it's too harsh. You want something lighter, right? Again, you don't want this, I'm driving one direction, immediately drive, you know, 90 degrees. That hurts physics, right? You want to incrementally 
over a period of time. Correct, right? You want to do it slowly. And so what that produces is something that we call the learning rate. Now, again, we're still in the correction phase. And so what we end up doing is we still have our error. We still have our inputs. But now we're also saying, when you mess up, how much do you learn? How much do you actually uh, figure out from this? Do you figure out one, right, which is potentially just a harsh overcorrection, or some small incremental little bit? Each practice is where you get a little better. That's where we start to get into this. Now, specifically, as you start getting into that question of like, well, it's a variable, right? LR, what's the number? Welcome to more research. Welcome to the first, uh, welcome to neural networks and the whole, anyone familiar with grid searching and tuning your hyperparameters? Are those words that you've heard? Some of you, yeah. Again, what we end up seeing when we deal with something like tuning our hyperparameters is specifically, what value should this be? Should it be one? Should it be 0 0.1? Should it be 0 0.01? Should it be 0 0.001? How strong should your learning rate be? And in fact, what grid search effectively does is say, let's try them all. Let's just try all of them, see what, which one performed the best. Right? That, that, that is the answer to that question. Oh, went too far. For my sake, I'm going to work off of just a thousandth. Why? Because you, you, you've seen my exams. I like a thousandth. It's a nice, it's further enough, farther, furthest, it's deep enough down that it works, right? So, okay, fine. So again, if you notice, right, I'm still just applying this math equation. I take my current weight, and I'm going to apply my weight plus whatever my error was, multiplied by whatever my input was, multiplied by just how much I'm going to learn for this moment, for this mistake. And there are my calculations. Okay, right, a little bit more simplistic. Now, you notice I didn't go fractions because trying to make fractions of that number terrifies me. So instead, I'm going to correct. Oh, look at that. Look at what we got going on here, right? And so you can see, okay, once again, I've got this uh, thing going on here where you can see wherever my zeros were, right? There's my ones, and there's, and wherever my ones are, hey, this is what's going on, right? That weight has changed a little bit. Now what happens? Well, I just repeat for the next one that I'm working off of. So in this case, if I saw 75, right, I would run it again. I still see that I'm wrong, right? 75 should be odd. We didn't fix it. But you notice it's the same binary kind of sequence. Again, you know it's going to be this last digit. And so uh, that's the part I want you to really focus in on, right? Notice where the ones are. Eh. Where the ones are. As I correct, those ones corrected, but notice what's happening to that last digit, right? The, the clear identifier for when we see something is an odd number. Everything else, right, it's going to start to kind of decrease, but because those don't really impact the odd or evenness as much, the one that we do see is. And in fact, we're going to continue to do this, right? You're going to notice in, a, in just a little bit when I demonstrate this, uh, right, that's going to continue working because I did it three times. Now I got to do it multiple times. And so this is where I will at least point out, uh, if you go on to uh, Moodle, there is a even odd uh, project available at your disposal. So again, what I have going on here is I happen to have just here's a digit, right? Here's just that digit formula. It's storing or the formula. Here's that digit object that we were dealing with, our inputs. It's just some numbers. I could have probably done ints. I didn't, 
I, I didn't. Uh, but hey, you know, there's the here's my hackery way of calculating out the binary for that. It's just doing division by two, uh, and then modulos, right? Okay, right. so that'll give me my binary uh, sequence. Here's how I get the label. I'm still using the odds and the positive and negatives to really kind of label that, right? Why we need that is because we do need a label, right? We need a ground truth of some form. Uh, and then the rest of this just going in there um, and then printing out that. But there's my perceptron. Hey, look at that. There's that, that calculation with that steering going on there. Uh, I got some debugging in here in case you want to uh, finagle with this a little bit more. I establish my weights. Again, you can see you could randomize those weights, right? You just swap out which one of these are going on. But then you notice I have my activation, right? Again, this is that calculation that's going on on the dot product. And there are multiple types that we'll talk about in a little bit. But you can see, again, hey, just whatever that dot product is. If it's greater than or equal to zero, huh. otherwise, eh. So I'm still seeing those same calculations going on here. Now, specifically, this is where we get into our guess, right? Think about what the activation is doing, right? In this case, you see, hey, I'm going to go and uh, just do a very quick dot product on my inputs times my weights, right, again. Uh, and then I'm taking whatever that sum is, passing it into that activation function that we just dealt with, saving the output, right? Because that's, again, that's the label. That's the classifier. But then we got the last thing, right? That training situation. That was the big thing. And again, you can see what we got going on here is uh, it's just pointing out what the error rate's going to be based on guess, right? Hey, I guessed. I probably shouldn't have my variable named the same thing as my method, but um, what you going to do about it? <laughs> right? Nothing. My point being, you can see what I'm going in. Here's my tuning of the weight. So here's my weight plus equaling the error times whatever the input was times the learning rate. And there. And so if we looked at that demonstration, here are those same numbers, right? I'm, do I'm doing this, you know, on purpose because right here are those numbers that I just showed you in class working through those same things. And I'm going to build out the whole perceptron with debugging. Let's see what we get going on here. I hate when it does that. Right, you can see, oh, just like we saw, right? Oh, when we guessed 48, we did all those calculations. It guessed it correctly. So since it did a good job, don't fix anything. You were right. But what happens when you were wrong, right? When you were wrong, 49 should have been a negative one, but that was wrong. So we got to update the weights. And you notice there's those updates. And then we'd see the same thing with 75. Right? Good, good. Okay, fine. Now, let's increase that. Now, let's say, okay, I'm going to build up uh, the same approach, but this time I'm going to work off of 300. I'm picking a small one mostly because since we're dealing with, like, you know, even or odd, right? I, I, I don't need a lot. Uh, uh, I want to really kind of see that, you know, the demonstration that this model is still failing at a small data set. But you can see, all right, I'm going to generate 300 random 8-bit digits, uh, and then I'm going to test on 100 random 8-bit digits. Right? Okay. And so you can see there's me doing some calculations. I'm just showing a bunch of printing the, those things, uh, and then we're going to test it. Right. So let's see, where's the thing I wanted to run through? All right. And so, after testing and training with a 90% accuracy, I have built something that can determine if something is odd or even. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now stop. And do it again. I have you so trained. My point being... <laughs> I did that on purpose, right? The whole setup, the whole slew, I did it on purpose because I wanted this to happen, right? Is it always going to happen? No, right? Again, if I went, look at that, right? Sometimes it's 100%, sometimes, 
Again, why? Because, again, random, right? Whatever it was trained on, right? That matters. But why I kind of present this is this is mostly like a little aside. Why the heck are you using a neural network for determining even or odd numbers? You've unnecessarily over-engineered your solution to a problem, Just, right? Everyone wants to throw AI into all your solutions right now. This is me getting on my soapbox and ranting for a little bit. You don't need to make AI everything. You don't need to have a, a chat GPT on your website. Please stop putting chat bots on your websites. If you're doing that for your senior design, stop it. Stop it. I'm going to treat you like an animal. No. 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 Oh, I, I will. Oh, please do not just throw. Again, right, this is the same stuff that we've seen for, for decades, right? At one point, it was put everything on the cloud, put everything on a blockchain. Now it's put everything on AI. You've learned what AI is, right? You don't need, you know, you are meant to make that, that next level step of like, do I need AI? Right? You need to sit down and think about your problems because sometimes you don't need a neural network because the neural networks are that great. Sorry, my rant is over. <laughs> and now I need to calm down. So you get to do it for yourself. Please correct the weights for 46, but specifically for determining if a model is divisible by three. Ooh. Uh, so let's see. We'll come back at uh, 350. 350. Other methods that you do in neural network land that sort of handle things better is the best way to think about it. And we are back. Let me see how you did. Boom, boom. All righty. So let's see. Ba -ba. Yep, okay. Right. You know, pretty straightforward here. Seems fine. Seems fine. 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 Uh, ooh, double check your stuff there. Uh, but yeah, for the most part. You... No, okay. I, I, so with that, again, remember you're not multiplying. Uh, your error is not the same as your, multi your, your error rate or your correction. So I get what that, you know, what you were looking for, right, um, in that sense. So, you know, double check on your calculations on what you were kind of looking at there. Uh, and then, yeah, for the most part, it looks like everyone's got it. Um, I'll, I'll kind of zoom, go on from there. So, yeah, okay, you've got, got it going on. Um, so again, like I was saying before, I you know while I was ranting, right? Again, there's a few different problems. One, right? I'm only dealing with uh, eight bits, right? I can only represent zero to two fifty five uh, on eight bits. That's not a lot. And so what happens? Well, again, all of those, <coughs> excuse me, all of those weights that I calculated, those weights only work for eight inputs. I cannot take these and transfer them over to a new model. That does not work, right? Because in theory, there's more neurons that uh, may be in place. And so those weights, right, it's a whole mess. So uh, again, we can't just, we have to, we would have to retrain the model, right? Uh, which becomes a major issue when you're dealing with more complex calculations, uh, because again, right, these things can take hours, but also you have to sit down and think about what your problem actually is because you may be over-engineering your stuff. And why I present that is because, right, think about the fact that you're, if you're working off of a, an AI neural network or something like that, you're most likely using some form of, um, <clears throat> what am I, uh, frame? you're most likely using some kind of cloud microservice that costs money, right? 
oh, well, if I'm going to use a neural network, I'm, I'm spending more money to fix this problem that, if we remember, was only 98% accurate. Whereas you all know the mathematical calculation, which is O of N, or O of N, O of 1, uh, of just like, hey, even or odd, right? So yes, you can do these things, but they are not always the best solution. There may be actual correct solutions out there. So we do have to double check them. Uh, but this is where now, okay, we, we learned it. I taught you the neural network. You're done. We can walk away happy. Now what else do we add to the neural network to really make it pop and you know, be the thing that runs our world and is doing more than just controlling even our odds? So that's where we start getting into the idea of something known as bias, right? So by, I'll say this. When we talk about like bias in AI versus bias in neural networks, different things. We'll talk about bias in AI in the ethics lecture, but bias specifically in the neural network, let's just add a little number. We did a calculation. Let's just add a little number to it. And the entire idea is we want to shift this a little bit. The reason why I say shift is because one of the things that you may be noticing is that this formula, right, of some input times some weight seems eerily similar to a formula you learned once upon a time. Y equals mx plus b, right? Oh, wouldn't you know it? We're essentially doing the same thing. The reason why the neural network was so powerful is because it's essentially trying to form a linear function. It's trying to build that linear separation that we've been seeing. Remember, I've talked about this in our principal component analysis, right? If you could just draw a line to separate your data, you're done. That's what neural networks are trying to do, right? And so, again, when we're thinking about the concept of bias, right, just from a visual standpoint, right, if I were to add two to whatever that Y is, right, what happens? It just shifts it. What happens? It just shifts it. So suddenly the bias is just essentially uh, uh, the bias that we're adding into the neural network is just kind of controlling that line, that linear function going on there. And so when we think about that, bias can uh, have its own weight, right? You, you can add it or you can add a weight to it, right? Again, I, I, I try and really point out the fact that this stuff is so kind of fluid, there isn't exact sciences to it, right? Yes, there are, you know, commonly accepted things. But the solution, the, you know, the real answer is which one did better for you? Right? If having a, a weight that you also shift is working, cool, do that. Right? If it isn't, cool, don't do it. Right? Um, but why do we present that? Is because when we start looking at different activation functions, you can see that that starts to shift a little bit more. Right? Okay, those calculations are still kind of having things, but instead of it going up and down, it's like, oh, right? it's pushing further and backwards. But why do we do that? Right? Why is there a bias? Well, specifically, what happens if I made my input all zeros, right? Think about just all my inputs are zeros, and it's guessing incorrectly for whatever reason, right? Because it does all the math, and it's wrong. I need to correct. Think about what the calculation was. How wrong were you times the learning rate times the input? But the input's all zeros. So what happens to weight? when we're dealing with an all zero incorrect solution or incorrect output. Nothing changes, right? You were wrong, but nothing changes. Bias is meant to at least let something change. Something has to shift. You were wrong, but nothing's getting correct because, again, the inputs were nothing, right? Bias is going to at least make sure something changes. So suddenly notice, hey, this is why a weight can be beneficial, right? Because suddenly, oh, let's make a correction off that input on the bias. It'll still always stay like one in this case. But suddenly at least something's shifting. Something's going to adjust, which we may need. 
The other thing I'll kind of think about is, right, when we, you notice, right, I, I talked about this idea of just a single perceptron and I was just presenting one perceptron to you. Well, again, the idea is, it's actually pretty good at linearly separable data. Ugh, say that five times fast, right? You notice, hey, if I'm just looking at even numbers, right, and I look at odd numbers, the label for those numbers is what I'm trying to get at here, right? I can draw a line here, right? If one, one would be a negative one, so it's here. Two, two would be a positive three, right? I have a way that I can just draw that line. This is where the neural network gets a little powerful because what happens if I'm dealing with something like a not gate, right? Oh, I can separate true and false, right? I can, if I have a way of designing out my, my algorithm, I have a way of saying whether or not something is true or false. And so now we start stepping it up. What about an AND gate, right? I have two inputs, an X, Y, both of them need to be true. Well, if one of them's true, but the other one isn't, right, that's false. If they're both false, they're both false. One's true, the other one's, but notice what happens when it's true. I have, I can, this line, I can generate this line. You can take my same example, right, Reconstruct it for you know the 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 AND gate. It'll work. It will work hands down. I don't have time to do it. That's an activity for you. Right? AND gate works. Not gate works. OR gate works. This is where the neural network becomes powerful. Is because I'm able to train a single perceptron a perceptron on not AND OR but there's one more. What's that last one? The XOR. What do I do there? Can I put a single straight line on this to fix it? Or to linearly separate it? No. No, right. Uh, let me put it here. Nope, because that one's getting misclassified. I put it here. Nope, that one here. Here, no, I can't put a line, I can't put a single straight line on this at all. And as a consequence, this is something that the single perceptron cannot do. This is a limitation to the neural network. Welcome to the AI winter. Neural networks have been around for decades, right? I've, I've talked about how these algorithms have always been around. Specifically, Marvin Minsky and uh, what is it? Yeah, Seymour uh, Papert, or I can never pronounce it. Yeah, him, right? Uh, both of them world renowned uh, uh, people, but essentially they saw the same problem, right? The, the you can't do the XOR gate comes from the Perceptron's book, which is heavily critical to the fact that you cannot do that. And in fact, this is where the AI winter started to come into play. Because again, modern or modern, right? Computers were starting to become well used. They had, we, we won World War II. We put people on the moon with computers. So like, again, people were dreaming up everything about the AI and what we could potentially do with it. However, I'm saying this almost like history is repeating itself and you're starting to see these words are repeating themselves, right? The hype train for AI was awesome, right? Oh, it's going to solve all our problems. Guido uh, von Rusum made the, uh, the, the robots play and that's where we get the word robot from, right? But the problem was that hype train kept going. Oh, it's going to solve all our problems. We're all going to have robot butlers, until everyone got disappointed with the actual results. Sound familiar? <laughs> right? What I'm trying to get at is, I mean, you know, look at what we're doing now, right? You know, so we were hyping it up back then. We're hyping it up back now. Right? You know, AI is just going to keep on going forward. That's more my point. But specifically, right, that became a major issue. This is where... We stopped development is what I'm really trying to get at. Grants got pulled. People were, you know, everyone who had the money that you could then use to do the research. 
Nobody wanted to work on AI because they saw the limitation at the time, right? Because we didn't have fast processing computers. We didn't have what we have now. It was only really about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that we really had the power to start doing the calculations. Because I, you, you remember I talked about like derivatives and I'm only talking about a single perceptron. What happens when I add perceptrons? What happens if the output that I was giving, I already erased it, what happens if the output I was producing from a single perceptron was being treated as the input to another perceptron? That's producing what we called the multi-layer perceptron network, right? Uh, or MLP. The entire idea is now each one of these perceptrons is hooked up just like our brain, right? It's a bunch of neurons hooked up, forming up some mesh network going on there. Now, specifically, you notice that we have the back propagation going in. Now, this is where I don't have enough time uh, at all, but the entire idea is that we are forming something known as a gradient descent, right? The idea is... As we are trying to make our corrections, notice it's not just correcting to one line, it's correcting to multiple lines. We're slowly, gradually trying to get to that target. It's the same thing we, you know, I showed you with the car analogy, but, right, bigger, then maybe not as big, that second turn. Uh, you know, again, when we think about the turn, how much of that turn is kind of this way? How much of it is this way? How much of it is that way? That's, right, big turn, smaller turn, maybe smaller turn, smaller turn, right? Gradual incrementals going on there, and that's where that whole correction starts to come into play. But specifically, right, oh, yeah, the part that I'm trying to get at here is we also have this element known as the neural net, or sorry, the uh, hidden layer. Well, these are just, they are passing in the nights, right? I have my inputs. I have that, you know, here's what the values are. I have what my output layer wants to be. We throw in these hidden layers that are just kind of making patterns along the way is what I want to kind of frame it as. Um, and in fact, that's where, if you have not seen the three blue, one brown eye series, I highly encourage it, right? Uh, especially their neural network, you know, literally this video, uh, it's on Moodle. Mostly because this is, remember, I'll, I'll get back to this thing. This is why people want explainable AI. This is producing right, some number, and then that number is like learning because we're correcting that number, and then a new batch is coming in, and we're correcting that number, and new batches. That's where it gets confusing. Like, what's that number? What's it doing? We don't know, or we are trying to understand is how I'll, I'll frame it. We don't have an answer. At least why I like this specifically in the uh, around the four minute uh, seven minute mark is specifically we're kind of like hand waving this solution and specifically uh, one theory is like oh all of these hidden layers are really just trying to activate these individual points on what it means to be a shape in this neural network right all those little things and then that second neural network is saying oh well let's take you know, maybe that loop, and that becomes its own pattern. And so that's our hand-wavy human way of trying to explain what's happening. But the crazy thing is, if you continue watching through that, that's not what is actually happening, right? That is, there is no, like, magic, oh, you know, I could visualize those numbers, and that's what I, no, it doesn't look like that, right? It doesn't look like that. It, again, that's our hand-wavy trying to explain what's happening thing going on there. Is it the actual way? Please do research. You know, please go to grad school, become very you know, world-renowned experts in explainable AI, and tell me. I would really like to know. Right? 
So yeah, I mean, again, that's, that's our approach to trying and explaining it, um, but that's open research. Again, explainable AI is incredibly important because if we can't explain it, we don't trust it, right? That's, again, right, the hesitations to AI, a lot of it is because we don't trust it. Uh, why I kind of present that is, again, what we're trying to do with the neural network is not just throw it in everything, but trying to gain better understanding of it. Remember, at the end of the day, what we are trying to do is model the decision-making process. So if our answer is nobody likes that, right? Nobody likes the answer to all decision-making is hand-waving, right? We don't like... We're trying to understand it. And conveniently, wouldn't you know it, uh, there is a paper that is like, hey, you know, you could take a neural network and it's, it's a decision tree. Uh, and, you know, I don't fully, you know, parts of it I can understand, parts of it I'm still trying to, you know, process in my own brain, but you can make it a decision tree, right? Oh, okay, well, the decision trees, if you remember, were intuitive, right? They were designed to be very, you could hand it to a lay person and they would, Get it, right? So it's an attempt at explainable AI. So as we kind of go through this, there's tons of things that we need to, you know, how do you build these things out? How do you get a good constructed neural network? What, how many layers do you add? How many layer nodes do you put in a hidden layer, right? All of that stuff, I just sort of did that too, right? Yes, again, Welcome to what it means to be, uh, you know, dealing with neural networks is specifically you are uh, building out the network and exploring all those possible combinations along the way. Um, this is a fantastic book, uh, Neural Network Design um, uh, by Hagen. Uh, there's the PDF for it. Uh, so if you're feeling extra froggy, and you want to dig into the ugly, you know, all the math and all the different types of networks, like the Bozeman's and everything. There you go. Um, but just because of, for the sake of time, right, I also only showed you one type of activation. And then I just like hand wove and like interjected them in, uh, but I never really like pointed them out. Well, again, rather than making it a solid, I want you to think about what I gave you, right, uh, uh, when it was this, right? What I was giving you was a square wave at, at the end of the day. So all of those different activation functions are, in essence, just trying to give you a less square wave. Instead of it being such a harsh 90 degree turn, Oh, hey, look at the sigmoid. Hey, look at the tan H. We still let it happen, but we don't let it happen as harshly going on there. That's essentially trying to solve that gradient descent problem or vanishing gradient, right? That's the same issue that we saw beforehand, right, where, oh, what happens when my number gets too small, right, from a decimal standpoint? Weights aren't really changing anymore, so we are trying to fix ways to do that. Um, in fact, that's what happens if you try and change to the divisible th by three. Nothing will solve it. None of the, the gradients will work. Um, however, I will keep on going. We also have the rel u, uh, rectified linear unit. This one's typically being used uh, for our uh, hidden layers, where essentially, hey, if, again, we're, we're dealing with like this, instead of, you know, again, we're just going to use that. If anything's in the negative, uh, if it's wrong, uh, whatever, we don't care. Just only, only positive vibes going on here, right? Um, that one's seemingly working actually quite well uh, for those hidden layers because, again, they are not being used for interpretation, but they are at the same time. Um, so at the end of the day, again, just for the sake of time, what's the pros? Super high prediction accuracy. Again, this is why it's running our world, is because it is very, like, again, as you build those structures and you start playing around with your sigmoids uh, or your, your, your activation functions and you, you know, do grid searching on what line, um, learning rate to be working off of, you get very, very nice results. And 
It works on all types of results, right? If you give it discrete values, well, just change the discrete values into numerical values, that works. If you got continuous values, well, all right, they're just decimals. We're just doing, multi, uh, you know, a dot, some uh, dot product. Uh, it works incredibly fast once it's trained also, right? However many layers you have, however many, you know, weights and everything, you, you've all been working, you know, with an LLM at some point already. If you have not messed with one at some point in the past two years, you're computer scientists. You need to go ahead and learn it, right? right? See how fast it is? You're not, you're not training it. It, it, it. It's very fast. It can do a lot of calculations very quickly. There are problems with it. It still has the issue of overfitting. Again, we'll talk about bias in AI uh, during our ethics. When you're dealing with it, you don't have any way of understanding what it's doing. Um, and then as you start trying to get into the concept of like, oh, could I, you know, translate, you know, the numbers into a 3D model to map, you know, uh, gestures, which is open research right now, of like taking, you know, input from a human body, translating it into a, a digital body, right? That's incredibly difficult. Who here? understands anything about kinesthesiology. That's a word. It's the study of your body, right? That fact that this is a joint and how it works, all that stuff, none of you have that unless you've been studying those types of things. And so how are you going to try and model how the body works if you haven't sat down to study that stuff? It's the same issues that we saw with knowledge representation happening all over again, right? So with that, any questions before I send you along your way? Yes. Um, I'll have to dig up and fully answer just for the sake of time. Um, the reason for it, it's, it's this, this activation has been shown to do a lot of accuracy. Right? It, it, when we use this whole just like if it's a negative number, throw out negative numbers. This is actually doing very well. So with that, have a good one. Wednesday we talk Gen AI. Take care.